these three um, newer therapies um, and your experience with using them. Um, and Susan did allude to the potential uh, respiratory problems that can occur, particularly with the trastuzumab and deroxetecan. What are some of the potential adverse events that we need to be educating our patients on and the incidence of, I mean, usually the worst don't happen to always be the most consistent um, adverse event. Um, and, you know, how do you specifically manage them? Um, Susan, again, have you got, um, you talked about the risk of ILD and pneumonitis. Um, what other experience or concerns I have think you? With our patients just stressing to report early, any symptoms, the dry cough, uh, being short of breath, fever, um, and just, just continuing edu education with them just to report. And of course, when they come in, assessing for nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, I think nausea has been an issue initially with the uh, trastuzumab. Mm -hmm. um, and so managing that with the right antiemetic prior you know, the day of, and then when they go home, that they understand their anti-medic regimen. So I think it's just making sure the family understands and that they're also a part of managing or helping to manage the patient, or if there's a support person. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I think patients are just overwhelmed and just making sure we have that support for them. Okay, great. And, um, you know, specifically, I suppose, too, with the use of neratinib is um, looking at the control study that gave us some ideas on how to manage uh, the diarrhea associated with neratinib. Um, uh, Lloyd or Alahi, uh, have you got any experience with um, using a lot of neratinib and management of the diarrhea? Yeah, we, we absolutely do. Um, we have um, changed our guidelines in relation to uh, managing the diarrhea with, of course, the new data. And so we tend to use cholesterol um, as well as Imodium together. Um, our duration of those two is mainly for the first four weeks. And if they do tolerate it well, we use them afterwards as PRN. The dosage of cholesterol, we do two grams um, twice a day for about the first four weeks. And then Imodium, we do four grams three times a day for the first two weeks to get down to twice a day um, and then can stop and use it as PRN. And that has greatly improved um, patient um, diarrhea and dehydration process. Um, the second um, side effect that mostly we talk about as well is the rash component with these drugs. Mm -hmm. so we do actually um, um, educate them about um, calling early um, and stopping the medication if any rashes do. The ILCS2 um, described is one of the key factors. I probably had only one patient um, with the lung toxicity. And, um, you know, um, educating them and uh, using CT versus uh, not the chest X ray has actually improved um, the outcome uh, for um, identifying these symptoms. Um, and I think, um, lastly, I would say um, hair loss in a, uh, patients who are receiving trastuzumab deroxamen. You know, most of the patients think about other, her, her two targeted therapies. Oh, I'm not going to lose my hair. But then, of course, this is a totally different concept. Um, and um, there is about 50% of hair loss component associated with this. So, those are really um, good to talk about upfront and set expectations, especially the hair is quite important for uh, most of the population. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. Often a lot of, particularly as a provider, you know, losing your hair, unfortunately, is not a vital, it's not a vital organ, um, but it's very, very important to who we are and our identity um, as patients. So I'm, you know, was a bit of a surprise for my, some of my patients too mm -hmm. on the studies um, with relation to hair loss. Uh, Lloyd, do you have anything that um, you would like to add to the discussion that we've had so far? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, well, I have had experience with uh, these three agents 
and I would say that I would, I would agree with what my colleagues have mentioned. And unfortunately, I have had cases of ILD, interstitial mm-hmm. lung disease, uh, patients being treated with uh, famdrastuzumab duroxtecan. And, and I think as a clinician, you know, whenever we're evaluating patients who have metastatic disease, keeping in mind that you know, prior to these treatments, we were now looking into ILD as one of our uh, potential causes for, you know, long symptoms, right, respiratory symptoms. But I think always at the top of our minds, you know, are they having a pulmonary embolism? Are they having a pneumonia? Are they having any sort of other, are you very common um, ongoing lung or respiratory issues that can can occur in patients with metastatic disease? But now ILD, again, it's coming at the top of your um, symptoms, or uh, sorry, the top of your diagnosis that could potentially be happening in this population um, that are treated. Um, with tucat- related to tucatinib, I think, you know, based on the new data, I have had certain patients on treatment, I would say overall well tolerated, have not experienced um, too many of the very well known issues with diarrhea. However, I have seen more of the hepatotoxicity. So monitoring the LFTs, uh, their liver function tests very closely, making sure that, you know, keeping that balance is this is because of, you know, visceral involvement in the liver or is this is more medication related. So I think it really helped us, uh, you know, keep things in perspective when we have patients on this type of treatment kind of where their symptoms are coming from or or those changes. And lastly, with naratinib, my experience has been more 50-50%. I have had patients doing either really well, you know, with their proactive management for for diarrhea. We have them on cholesterol. We have them on pyramide. Um, Respond really well, especially those 50 first 56 days of their, you know, two cycles, and then they, you know, have an improvement after that. And I have had patients who have had to discontinue treatment after a week because grade four and then admission, hospitalization, IV fluids, despite all the anticipatory management that we did for diarrhea. So I think it's, my experience has been kind of combined, but overall, I think I agree with Elahi and Susan that, you know, we just have to be mindful that knowledge is power. And if we really help our patients obtain that that education, that knowledge that they require to help us identify early because a lot of the time they cannot, with everything that they have at home, they are not able to manage, but they can help us communicate and hopefully we can tackle those symptoms early on so we don't evolve into a grade three or four symptoms um, when they are experiencing them. Great, thank you so much. Um, You know, obviously we've covered a lot. And, you know, there are a lot of new agents available now for HER2 targeting. Um, What advice would you like to give not only your, um, you know, your advanced practice nurse practitioners um, and maybe some of the community physicians, but particularly oncology nurses who are seeing a lot of these new agents now, either in their infusion centres or having to do a lot of education with their patients, what would advice would you give them? And maybe Susan, you could um, start us off. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I would say I have been an oncology nurse for many years and was around in 1998 when Trastuzumab was approved. So just seeing how cancer, particularly breast cancer, has evolved over the years has just been an amazing thing to watch. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel really old. I feel like I'm getting out now soon, but um, I would encourage oncology nurses that this is the best thing you could ever do. Um, It'd be, it's the most challenging. Mm -hmm. It's the most rewarding. Um, I would say you're ever learning, ever growing, and probably will always be touched by the fact that you're involved in someone's life, making an impact. Mm -hmm. Um, So from that point of view, I would also say that now they should take a molecular biology course (laughs) and a genetics course um, as part of their educational learning. I feel like I'm on the back, you know, on the back end trying to catch up, but certainly it's exciting just to see how how things are just moving along. Um, Yeah, so 
That's what Great. I mean. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, Alahi, what about you? What would you? What advice would you give to our oncology um, nurse specialists? Um, I would say um, focus on patients, listen to them, um, because they will tell you exactly what their preference is going to be and what their side effects are. Um, know, know the drug. It's really important to know the actions of the drug and the side effects. This is how we're going to take care of our patients because it's a key factor. People have been taken off clinical trials. People have been taken off medications any type of treatment because of adverse event when the treatment was actually working. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we should pay attention um, to the side effects. And lastly, I would say, you know, this is um, a large landscape um, area. So uh, reach out to everybody, reach out to people that you know, reach out to different colleagues to get um, the more up to date or any of their experience like uh, this program right now. Um, all, everybody's, if you Google, we all out there, we have our emails out there. So please feel free to reach out, absolutely. And I think that's a great point, Allah, is, is looking at your resources and understanding those. Um, obviously for all of these new therapies, the, um, the pharmaceutical companies that obviously are bringing them to market do have some fabulous educational tools, um, not only for us as providers, but also that we can utilize to help with our patients. And I think that's always a really good reminder as well. Lloyda, what would you like to add for us? So I think my advice for my colleague in, in oncology nursing would be embrace your role of patient advocate. I think one of the key things that we can do as healthcare professionals are empower knowledge, empower your own knowledge as a professional through academic resources, get to know the, the latest you know, evidence in nursing and in treatment for cancer that is out there. It can be overwhelming, but it can be dissected and digested very well. And also maximize your resources because if you have that knowledge for yourself, you are able to transmit that knowledge via patient education and that's what patients need. Uh, they need the care for the, themselves and the family members. If they don't know what to expect, they're going to have more complications. And if you as a provider, as a healthcare professional, as a nurse, know the care that your patients are going to be needing and to anticipate those needs is going to be very helpful. So my advice would be get to know your treatments, become familiar, have the knowledge, have your knowledge in symptom management because that's something that we can embrace very well. And as advanced practice providers, you know, we go one step, you know, uh, further that we can help diagnose and, and manage more of those complicated cases as well. And my last point, become very friend, very good friend with technology. We're going to need it. This is moving forward and you have to help your patients navigate those new waters of technology. So it's another tool in our box of resources and we just have to go with it and embrace it and get started. it. <laughs> I absolutely agree. And that is something I'm still struggling with myself. I'd like to say, you know, a huge thank you to our guests here today uh, for this lively and informative discussion. I really appreciate each of your experience, um, years of experience, and the advice that you have given is, is just fabulous. So thank you again. And to our viewing audience, I hope we have addressed some of the concerns or questions that you have. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed this on live presentation of Breast Cancer Talk. Um, there are resources um, through Onc Live, and we hope to see you again another time. Thank you very much. <laughs>